I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anne-Marie Morse, who is a board-certified adult neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology and sleep medicine. She's the director of the Child Neurology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine Center at Janet Weiss Children's Hospital, and she has significant clinical experience and interest in pediatric and adult patients with sleep-wake disorders. You can find Dr. Amory Morse on social media under the handle Dam Good Sleep, D A M M Good Sleep. Um, that's Dr. Amory Morse. And so please do um, follow her on social media because she provides a huge amount of resources and content on all things sleep related. Welcome, Dr. Amory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. I appreciate it. How's everyone doing today? <laughs> Not sleepy, that's good. That's a good place to start. Um, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Claire, for shouting that out um, in regards to my social media. And if you didn't catch it, DAM stands for Dr. Amory Morris. I'm not trying to be vulgar. vulgar. Um, so I'm always so privileged to have the opportunity to attend and be able to be a part of such meaningful conferences like this. I think that really you should take a look around because when I walked in this room, I went, Damn, D-A-M-N, <laughs> there are a lot of people here and I hear there's hundreds of people also online. This goes to the point that Lynn Marie Trotty just made that IH is likely not so rare. And so I congratulate you all today for finding your community because this is an incredible community to be a part of. Hypersomnia Foundation has done an incredible job of bringing people together and really melding together those who are in the healthcare space, physicians, researchers, et cetera, pharmaceutical companies, and those who are on this journey. And so I'm really excited to be able to deliver a talk that is talking about what it's like to live day to day with IH and what are the opportunities that continue to exist. One of the hashtags I love beyond, uh, that I love for Beyond Sleepy and Hypersomnia Foundation is hashtag this is IH. On my LinkedIn, this is one of the things that I look forward to every single day of seeing the new faces of people who are putting themselves out there to raise awareness on this is what living with IH looks like. It's an invisible disorder. And so people purposefully making that effort is incredibly necessary for those who are undiagnosed to become diagnosed. And also for what Lynn Marie had just uh, mentioned, to reduce the stigma associated with it. So we're gonna talk day to day living with IH. So the objectives, what is the reality of living with IH? The good, the bad, the meh, could do without that. Navigating life with IH, some of the drug dilemmas that we may see, and then reimagining. IH. So first we're going to set the stage. I don't know if this next slide is going to work or not, but you guys get access to it later. So this may be familiar to some of you of what this journey can look like. There's a period potentially where you had no symptoms and then there was a symptom onset. You're like, hmm, this doesn't seem normal. You were struggling and seeking care, dismissed, missed, and misdiagnoses. You were delayed but determined. You finally find your right healthcare partner. You have found your social support, and now you're making strides, and hopefully you are at the point or getting to the point of living a life worth living. So what's the reality of IH? The bad. It's an elusive, invisible diagnosis plagued by inadequate understanding, awareness, testing, and treatment. There are not enough hours in the day. No matter how much I sleep, it doesn't matter. If I wish there were 48 hours in one day. Maybe I could actually produce the same quality of life and living as someone without IH. There's not enough restorative feeling sleep. It makes me hate sleep. It angers me to even think about sleep, although it's something I want all the time. It's kind of like how I feel about chocolate. Constant compromises, even with activities of daily living being overwhelming. The idea of a shower 
being overwhelming. What's the good? You found our community. Welcome. There is increasing attention awareness. When you see events like this, I have attracted hundreds of people. It is telling you that it is a growing area of attention. When you see a study like what Limerie just presented, the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort, and you're seeing that there's a purposeful analysis of that data to say, how common is this? It's raising awareness. There's increasing study to understand the why. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but as a resident in neurology, anytime we would talk about idiopathic anything, my attending would say to me, Anne-Marie, do you know what idiopathic means? I said, yeah, we don't actually know the underlying reason as to what the pathophysiology is. She goes, no, it means that the doctor's an idiot and the poor patient is pathetic. <laughs> so I would like to not be an idiot anymore. And I would like to be able to say at some point in time, this is the etiology and the pathophysiology. And there's increasing number of treatments being studied and available. And it's really amazing that we do finally have our first and only FDA approved treatment. And that medication does have data to support that it can be transformational for individuals. But unfortunately, that is not well socialized or, or understood amongst our community. So what does navigating life with IH actually look like? So you wanna personalize your journey. Again, thinking about this is what IH looks like. There's no two people on this slide who look the same. And so for me as a physician to say that the treatment strategy and the expectations and the goal setting look like this is completely ignorant. And that means I am the idiot to potentially say that. Because this is IH. When you look in the mirror every morning, this is IH. These are the cards I was dealt. But how am I going to win this hand? You can bluff it and still make a lot of money, or you can actually win with four aces. So we already did the journey. The reality for many people living with IH is existing is hard. I have shared at uh, different talks that when I first meet a person in my clinical practice who has idiopathic hypersomnia, and I finish doing the, and they don't know it yet, right? Uh, that's the reason they're seeing me. Uh, and I already have this as my primary differential. I always like to ask the question, what do you think is going on? What do you think might be the problem? Invariably, every single time. You know, I, I think it's just, I can try harder and maybe I'm just a little lazy and maybe, and why do they have that perspective? Because when they say to their significant other or their parent or otherwise, I just don't have the energy to take a shower. I just can't, I can't even think about cleaning my room. I can't even think about doing the dishes. Comes the label of, you're not trying hard enough. You're lazy. You're not doing it. But the reality is, is that these can be overwhelming tasks to even think about, never mind execute. Never mind those instrumental activities of daily living. The things as a society we just expect to happen. You're gonna clean a house, you're gonna manage money, you're gonna be able to adapt to a community. And so those things seem like overwhelming tasks. And so when you go to a, a physician and they're like, we're gonna make your sleepiness better. You're like, I just want, my hair to be clean. Can we work on that first? The reality is, is that being able to look at these and acknowledge it and say, these are the things I struggle with. None of these show up on the upward sleepiness scale. At least not the versions I've seen. The reality is, is that when I, as a physician, set my goals to move you from a 17 to a five, I have already failed you. That is not your goal. Your goal is to be able to exist and that not be hard. One of the things I think is important is when you're talking about home and family, how do we make these transitions? How do we make it from moving from it's hard to be able to live with someone? 
I'm married, I want us to be happily married, or I'm a child, and I want my parents to be proud of me. How do we move beyond the labels of I'm not trying? How do I break that as a character trait of who I am? Developing comfort for yourself with being able to identify exactly what it is that you're experiencing. Self-awareness and the ability to put that into words, to communicate with others what your personal experience is, is the very first step you can take in removing those character traits as a part of who you are, and rather the disease that you're experiencing. So when you're developing this comfort, you may want to be able to think about the language you want to utilize in describing this to all the people who are in your life. And those stories and those descriptions may be different if you're communicating it to family and people who you really trust and you want them to really understand the level of disability compared to maybe friends or employers. You telling your significant other or your, the closest people in your family about how you struggle to even think about wanting to shower may not be what you wanna talk about with your employer. So you're creating your own guardrails, but you are the one that is leading this. You are the director of your story. You wanna identify also what you can need help with. We've started to adapt this mentality that we're lazy and just not trying enough that we almost feel guilty when we are asking for people to help us because it's a feeling like we're reinforcing that narrative. We're reinforcing that, I just can't do it, I'm lazy. But being able to get to that first part allows you to expose that second part. You've communicated where you struggle and now you're able to communicate, this is where I would be able to exceed expectations better if you're able to help me with these things. You also may wanna ask family um, to help in advocating for you and describing what they observe, the good and the bad. This becomes critical in my clinical practice. When I have a patient come with family or other people who spend a lot of time with them, because one of the things I've learned for my patients who have idiopathic hypersomnia is sometimes they accept great being down here instead of being up here. And so they're going, yeah, everything is great. The medication is great. I'm great. I'm here. Because as had been described earlier, they show up, but they don't show up. So the people who come with them many times are able to fill in those blanks for me. And then together, we're able to actually create a plan to be able to move things forward. Sometimes those are things we don't appreciate is what others are seeing for our own limitations. So don't limit yourself by the disbelief of someone else. This is the other challenge. People start to go, I don't even wanna tell people because they don't believe me that I have a disorder. They don't believe that idiopathic hypersomnia exists. I heard a horrifying story yesterday about um, uh, a young woman who had a uh, central disorder of hypersomnolence and her soon to be fiance wanted to hear about it. And his, some of his comments were, well, I wanna know what I'm gonna be sad with. And I said, I really hope your response was run. It was, um, but the reality is that people don't believe it because it's different than other disabilities. If I walked in and I couldn't move my arm on my leg, you go, she has a disability. When I walk in, I look the same as everyone else. I'm the same as everyone else. No one recognizes that I have a disability. And it's a double-edged sword because everyone here is the same as everyone else, except it's a lot harder for you to exist in the same capacity. In terms of academics and employments, I purposely have on the bottom here some resources from the Hypersomnia Foundation because as I'm sure you've all identified, they've curated an incredible amount of resources. But with the idiopathic hypersomnia, these are disorders that are protected by the American with Disabilities Act. 
And so under the age of 18, when you're in school, you are eligible for things like a 504 plan and even potentially an IEP. What is the distinction between these two? A 504 plan is afforded to you under the Americans with Disabilities Act. An IEP, an Individualized Education Plan, is afforded to you under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. 504 equal access, IEP equals success. So the standards are different for an IEP. 504 is just saying, we wanna give you all the things so that you are able to have access the same as someone without a disability. For that reason, 504-like accommodations can follow you into college, so you can have equal access, but IEP accommodations do not, because it's not equal success opportunity. In addition to those things, we always are focused on the scholastics. There also are other things that can make living more reasonable. So looking at academic adjustments, so um, uh, having different accommodations there, but also housing preferences, making sure that potentially you have housing that's closer to where your classes are. So if you do need a nap or you do need downtime, that you're able to do that, that you have preferential scheduling. So you're trying to have your classes at the time of day, that potentially you have a higher likelihood of feeling more alert um, uh, and also having things like on-campus support. In terms of there also are accommodations that can be um, provided. So first and foremost, having a diagnosed IH may influence what your career choice is. However, in whatever career you're doing, some of the things that people don't realize is that there's occupational therapists who are trained to evaluate what type of accommodations might allow for you to be your best productive person while you're at work. So is, are you a person who should have a standing desk? Are you a person who should be sitting on a medicine ball to um, make sure that you're engaging different mus muscles so that you stay more alert? In terms of employment, there must be reasonable accommodations. Um, uh, and so this basically means that it doesn't cause undue hardship on the employer, but it enables the employee to do their essential job functions even on their worst day. One of the things I, I will commonly hear from uh, different patients is that I don't really need these accommodations. I can, I can do it. I can power through it. And it's like 99% of the time, that's probably true. But on that 1% of the time, you don't want that to be a reason for someone to say you're not doing well enough. Disability insurance and then um, uh, different types of uh, short-term disability and long-term disability are things that sometimes we do look at and consider and evaluate um, and, and making sure that you also are exploring whether or not things like supplemental um, security income may be able to compensate for what you may not be able to do in terms of your work. It is not uncommon that individuals with central disorders are hypersomnolence. It's not just unemployment, but it may be underemployment. So being able to have these types of supplemental um, avenues can make it much more livable. In terms of technology, we are a technology society. And in fact, there is an act called the Assistive Technology Act, which is intended to promote people's awareness of and access to assistive technology devices and services. How many people in this room who have IH or don't have IH use any type of technology to assist in their day-to-day -day function? I would say that probably all of us do, right? I know that my cell phone is attached to my hip. Right now it's not, which is surprising. Um, but it's because of the fact that it has compensated for so many things that I don't need to do anymore. The calculator in it is a perfect example. I used to be great. I had 112 average in calculus. Now I can't do simple arithmetic. So thank God that I have a calculator. Um, and so this is really important to explore what type of assistive technologies are there. So the reality is, is that companies like Apple and Microsoft have realized that this is so critically important. And this is just an illustration of some of the accommodations that are available through these technologies. Who uses Siri? Siri knows all. It's either uh, Siri or Alexa or someone, they're always listening and they many times can answer questions I didn't even know I had. Um, but things that are really helpful is that they can have things like spoken content, listen along as you read or write. 
they have um, live speech, they have Safari Reader. Many times patients will tell me that it's hard for them to read something online because of the fact that they get distracted by these other things because the brain fog makes it hard for them to attend and be able to do that. I used to love to read, but now I can't. This allows for there to be less distractions, allow you to zoom right in. You can use things like Copilot that will be literally your Copilot to be able to identify where your needs are. The thing that is great is that I looked at this and I said, I had no idea that there were so many resources like this. How do I go through here and select which one would be helpful for my patients? Again, this is where occupational therapists can be helpful because they are familiar with this, but they also both have support desks that help you to walk through which ones of these may help you solve the problems that you're experiencing. So for me, I would say out of this presentation, this is probably the most important. Because if you're a person who is saying, well, I really don't wanna ask for help or how is someone gonna be able to help me to be able to remember more or to be able to read these articles or to be able to, you fill in the blank. You now have met your new friends, your technological friends. They're gonna allow you to be more successful in those manners. In terms of social life, how can I get support as a person with IH? And so again, I do think that this is really important because if I'm struggling with activities of daily living, where in my priority spectrum is going to be engaging with other people? This is really important because having a central disorder of hypersomnolence can be very, very isolating. And with that isolation brings a whole host of other mental health challenges, but it also further burdens your cognitive performance. And so leaning into your supportive communities leaning into who are the people, the boots on the ground around you. You wanna make sure that you also consider things like psychology support. For myself and my clinical practice and at my organization, this is a priority for every single patient I see who has a chronic disease. In fact, I developed a um, support group for our teenagers at my institute called LEAP, Launching the Empowerment Adolescence Program. And what that organization does is it invites any teenager who has a chronic disease to come to it. It is purposely never, ever, ever at the hospital. What we do is we go to escape rooms, out to dinner, go bowling. Increasing in 10 years, we've seen anywhere from a 40 to 110% increase in suicide in teenagers. What I was seeing was that my teenagers who had chronic disease were more susceptible to these types of acts because of the social isolation in marginalization. I bring this point up not to be grim. I bring it up because the people who have these thoughts don't endorse them to others. And so if there's any person in this room or online who has those thoughts, my reminder to you is you have found your community and that is not the right solution. Social life and social support is a critical element to being human. You're human first, but experiencing a difficult journey. And so I just want to have that very, very serious delivery about a very, very serious topic because of the fact that that does make a difference. Navigating in a medical landscape, that is hard. It's hard because we set you up for failure. We set you up for failure because we make it hard to access us, make it hard for you to follow up with us, and make it hard for you to get the insurance approvals. And then we just assume you can do it without any help. Think keys that be able to help you be more um, uh, successful is number one, selecting the right HCP, right? Your right healthcare partner. Why? Because you want someone who listens, who responds, who is there for, who understands the disorder. They don't need to be the expert. They just need to be your peer. Again, Hypersomnia Foundation has a great resource where you can go on there and you can see who are people who have volunteered to be like, I'm that person. I want to help you. It also is important for you to be in a driver's seat. Be prepared. Come to your appointments with, what is my good? My bad? Meh. This could be better, but I can live with it. If you don't come prepared with those resources and th that information, what do I do? Nothing for you, nothing that's helpful. 
It is my own preconceived notions as to what you need. Do I know you better than you? Absolutely not. You should be setting your goals of care. What do I want to see improved in my life? If it's showering, say that. I want to be able to shower at least three times a week. Great. Again, that's not on the Epworth. And then be able to define progress. You want to map out what is success and when you need to detour. You want to be able to say, yes, I want to shower three days a week. That's not happening. Uh, it's only once a week. Is there a different option that we can get there? When we don't have those metrics of progress, what happens? I see you today, I see you again in three months, and at three months, you're either no better or potentially worse because we didn't have any interval measures for you to lean on to then be able to reach out to me to say, <laughs> to be able to um, uh, make a difference in plan. And it has to be collaborative. The anticipatory guidance and transdisciplinary management by phase of life and goals. What do I mean by that? When I'm taking care of a child who has AIH and they grow up to now be an adult with IH who maybe is married and has children, they all have different goals. And even within that same age group, they have different goals. And I specifically emphasize the trans transdisciplinary. Why? You had just heard that IH is not the only thing that you may experience. There may be other things. Is it helpful when I have brain fog and having difficult enough time navigating just seeing the sleep doctor to also remember what did my cardiologist, endocrinologist, X, Y, Z say? Don't you guys talk to each other? Don't you have a health record that like is electronic? You're supposed to talk to one another. So being able to ask about those types of things. Symptom diaries, I think, are really very important. And so this can go in one of two ways. Again, thinking about those um, uh, different technologies that you can utilize. Maybe you're like, this sounds great. A symptom diary would be awesome. There's no way I'm writing. There's no way I'm typing. Dictate it. Speak the text. The reason why is because this is your directions as to where you want to go. You're able to be to tell someone, this is what I'm experiencing, the pattern that it is. Otherwise, you're leaving it up to someone else's interpretation of what you may or may not be experiencing. And you're leaving it up to someone else to interpret whether what you're experiencing is relevant to them. That sounds like it's a GI thing. You should talk to the GI doctor. But it only happens after I take my medicine. Do you think it's a GI thing or do you think it's my medicine, right? Those are two different conversations. So it's a way of empowering you to get the care you specifically need and personalizing your journey. So what can a symptom diary look like? It can look like this, right? You have something that tells me my symptoms, the onset and offset, the severity and its, um, its associated disability, what are the modifying factors, things that make it better or worse, your medication timing, dose and effects, what your sleep patterns look like. And it could be in a, like a, an agenda like this, or you can do it as something that has more detail. Um, overall, it could look like something like this. This allows for someone to take a look at this and go, huh, looks like there's a lot of room for improvement. Even without you saying a word, I can look at this and go, interesting, you're definitely having excessive daytime sleepiness. You know, this doing things and not remembering, that's something called automatic behavior, right? It also allows me to give you new words that you're now able to communicate with other people. You know the reason why you saw my, found my cell phone in the freezer? That's something called an automatic behavior. So it allows for you to have better communication. The better communication is going to lead to better outcomes that you value, not just a healthcare system. What about the drug dilemmas? Does anyone have any drug dilemmas in here? That doesn't exist, right? the bane of all of our existence. So in terms of prescription management, it typically should go something like this. There's doctor discussions, and then we have the denials. Always, especially for IH, because they like to tell us that you don't have narcolepsy. And I go, yes, I'm glad you got caught on to that. Um, then there's the initiation, the titration, and optimizing outcomes. And although that all sounds like it's the same thing, right? The initiation, titration, and optimizing outcomes, it's not. It's step-by-step. Step. 
It's me trying to understand what works for you. And the same thing, you understanding what works for you. And what does that look like? So doctor discussions and drug decisions. So doctor discussions, there should be a conversation around what are the symptoms? What are the things that are the pain in the ass for you that you want better? What is the disability associated with the symptoms? It's not enough for you to be like, I'm just so sleepy. What does the sleepy do? The sleep inertia, oh, I just can't get out of bed. What, what is the disability you experience? Well, I can never take my kids to school. That's a disability I experience. I would really like to do that. That's a tangible goal, and it feels good when I achieve it. That's different than me saying, I can wake up now, versus I'm doing something with meaning. I can take my children to school, and that's important to me. Do you have any comorbidity? That's going to influence our conversation around what is the potential risk and benefit of each of these choices? What is your goal of care? Overarching. And what's the expected time to benefit? I start one drug versus this drug. This is going to help you get this experience in five days. This one in five weeks. It's important for you to know that. It's important for you to be able to give me those feedback. Drug decisions tend to be based on what are the prior medications that have been tried and outcomes. One of the things that you should also hear is that if you've tried a medication in the past and it wasn't that successful for you, it doesn't mean you failed it necessarily. It just may mean that you needed it in combination with a different medication. So if you've tried a medication and you had some benefit but not optimal benefit, and then that got taken away and got put on something else, you can still revisit it. If there were major side effects, I would say don't revisit it, okay? But I think that's important for you to hear because I've seen too many patients who are like, I've tried that and they took that away and they put this on. Uh, did you have side? No, I didn't have side effects. I was better, but just not as good as I would like to. What is the rationale for use? So Lynn Marie did a great job also of showing these are all the different drugs. We have one FDA approved drug that has really great data that shows why it's effective, but these are some other medications. Your question should be, why should we use this medication versus that medication? What is the benefit? What is the risk? Um, and then also, what is the polypharmacy strategy? How are we adding these medications together? The polypharmacy strategy should be based on all of those factors within the doctor discussion. And you always, always are gonna to wanna to ask about the contraindications or, res, or reason um, to not use other alternatives. Interestingly, in regards to those drug decision pieces, this is also many times the things that the insurance wanted to see in our note. So you asking these questions actually help your doctor make a better note and less likely for it to get denied. So drug denials, what can you do on your side? the bane of everyone's existence. And then you sit and you go, well, I'm waiting for the doctor's office to figure it out. I hope they got my message. I called the insurance company again. So first find out why your claim was denied. I've had many times where patients know better than what the doctor's office did. Um, you can then call your insurance provider. You can call your doctor's office. You can collect the right paperwork. You can submit an internal appeal. Um, uh, wait for the answer. And then if needed, you can submit an external review. The top three things to remember, if a claim is denied, don't panic. Um, it could be a simple error. I've seen that definitely in, in um, terms of what the diagnostic um, ICD code that they used. Um, uh, so instead of using IH, they just put excessive daytime sleepiness uh, and they're going, well, that's not going to get this drug approved. Uh, when contacting an insurance provider about the denial, make a list of questions and gather all important documents beforehand. This is important, especially um, uh, if, you, if you do have a lot of brain fog, that you feel prepared when you're going into that, um, especially knowing how hard it is to get anyone on a phone. Um, uh, you wanna make sure that you don't have to make that number uh, call multiple times. You do wanna try and keep detailed notes, including the name, title, and phone number of the person you spoke with, because that does become um, a good documentation trail, especially if you end up needing an external review. This is all gonna be really good supportive documentation to show what the burden related to this is. When appealing the claim, be persistent. Send your insurance company a note being as specific as possible about why your claim should be paid and including as much evidence as you can to support your argument. Other things that do become really relevant in some of these conversations include what are the disabilities you've experienced by not having whatever medication or otherwise that you need. 
I missed this many days of work. There was injury. There was, you name it. That becomes really um, uh, substantial when we're able to include that in our health record to be able to submit to the insurances. So when you're talking about access starting and titration, I do think it's important to always individualize the strategy. You do want to consider polypharmacy. I, uh, yesterday I was, was at a, um, a meeting and I had heard people say, well, my patients who have narcolepsy, yeah, polypharmacy is like the rule, but my patients with IH, I don't typically need, I don't need polypharmacy. And I was just like, really? You don't need polypharmacy. And what I realized is it wasn't that the patients didn't need polypharmacy. It's exactly what we talked about earlier. We accept a lower level of success than what's possible. So if I'm not endorsing that I'm still struggling, I perceive it as I'm a really good doctor. I yeah, got away with only using one medication. There's also some shame that I've found around with a stigma around needing to use more than one medication. A lot of times people are like, well, I, I just don't want to have to be dependent on it, or I don't want to um, have like this false living because I'm on all these medications. And so my response to that is typically stating that my goal is always to have a medication regimen that fits your life rather than a life that fits your medication regimen. And so making sure that, again, you're identifying um, what your disability is experienced, also playing into what your prior experience with other medications. Um, and then again, really reinforcing this idea of mapping out progress. Now, when talking about mapping out progress, there is the instructions on, this is what you can expect. This is what I want you to do. But you also wanna know, when are we checking in? because we've talked about what I should expect and what I should do, but I need to know that we also are going to have a follow-up in place, whether it's a phone call or a message or whatever, for us to make sure that there aren't further adjustments we should have. What are the reasons I should have an earlier check-in? What is the, I need to pull that, oh no lever. And then what is the best method to check in? Do I need to actually have a visit? Do I need to schlep myself into your office? Can we do telemedicine? Can it be a phone call? Can it just be a message? Can it be a my turn message? And that's important because having those types of expectation setting leaves you less liable to going, I think this is right. I think that this is what is expected. In order to optimize outcomes, communication. If we are not hearing you, and you're not telling us what it is that you want as your goal of care, you are going to fall prey to being the Epworth, okay? And I don't think there's a person in here that I saw that has a name of 17 or 16 and wants to have that legally changed to five. So it is really important for you to communicate. Healthcare fails every single day because of a failure in communication. There's tons of publications that demonstrate that, even resulting in death. Um, so it is really important for you to communicate the good, the bad, the meh. Worry is the misuse of imagination. So let's reimagine IH. First and foremost, community awareness. How friggin' awesome is that we have a day now? Can we, come on. If you want to talk about community awareness, this right here is evidence that you now are being heard. You are not only being heard, that people are starting to listen. Idiopathic Hypersomnia Day demonstrates not only the Hypersomnia Foundation's commitment to this disorder and educating and awareness and moving the mark forward, it now is demonstrating a national stage for us to celebrate every year our community and the progress we're continuing to see be made. This is an incredible, incredible opportunity for us to destigmatize and abandon the lexicon of laziness and not trying hard and allowing for people who have put themselves out there every single day saying, this is IH. This is going to be the reason that we actually are going to broaden this community and help others achieve a better way of living 
who are suffering undiagnosed. This is truly an incredible accomplishment and I give you guys tremendous praise because I know that this was very hard work. The future, a better future today. Share the correct narrative. What do I mean by that? This is your story. Hashtag this is IH is there for a reason. Every individual story is different, but being able to communicate, this is what it's like to live with this disorder, allows for you to tell the narrative that I'm not freaking lazy. This is a medical disorder. If I had epilepsy and had a convulsive seizure on here, on stage, no one would ever say that I'm doing it for show. You're not, you're not doing this for show and you're not lazy, you're not stupid. It is important for you to drive the narrative. You are the director of your own movie. Define your symptom burden. This is important. This empowers you to be aware for yourself, but to communicate that as a part of your narrative and also engage your healthcare partner to tailor the care, which is pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, to achieve a better outcome. So take control. This is my challenge for you today. If you are not already in control and you're not already in a driving seat, get yourself in there. Continue to engage in social support. This is a pillar of health. I love when Julie Flygar will talk about the fact that we should, we should probably almost be accused of medical malpractice if we're not prescribing social support. As I had mentioned earlier, the marginalization and isolation of these disorders can be detrimental. And so this social engagement is very, very important. And then take advantage of those assistive technologies. There's no shame in that. We're all utilizing them anyway. It's a matter of personalizing what is the spectrum of those assistive technologies that allow you to live your best life. Thank you.